We are pleased to provide the video recordings of Florida Digestive Diseases Update held on December 4th and 5th, 2021 in Orlando, Florida. I am pleased to present this video recording from the final session, Section 6, on the pancreas and the bile duct. In this session, we have lectures on acute pancreatitis, how to prevent pancreatic necrosis by Dr. Santi Swarup Fagi. This is followed by a lecture on pancreatic cysts, What is the Fuss About? by Dr. Anne-Marie Lennon. A third lecture is on chronic pancreatitis, how to manage pain and weight loss by again Dr. Santi Swarup Vagi. And finally, the single-use studinoscope for infection control, solution or overkill by Dr. Stephen Edmundowitz. This final session is concluded with case presentations and discussion with Dr. Varadara Julu. Please enjoy this final session. So we had... Um, folks from 22 states attending this meeting and from five countries. So thanks for being here. This is going to be a very exciting session. We have got a star faculty to discuss pancreas and the bile duct, and I will introduce each of them. And first and foremost, uh, to talk about uh, pancreatitis, it's acute pancreatitis. How do we prevent necrosis uh, by Dr. Shanti Vege? So Shanti is, uh, uh, is from a home country, India. He, I think, has been... Uh, uh, he, has, he has been awarded the Best Teacher Award at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester for 20 consecutive years. Uh, his, his, his publications are prolific. He's encouraged us a lot to do clinical trials. He's been a good mentor to me. Uh, but his claim to fame is actually not pancreas. Uh, he also happens to be the uncle of uh, Miss, Uni Miss America, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and his son-in-law happens to be uh, a CEO of a large multi-billion dollar company out of London. So I think Shanti is probably going to retire very soon and go take care of the grandkids. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, thanks uh, so much for joining us, Shanti, and, and educate us on pancreas, how to prevent necrosis. Thank you. Thank you, folks, and uh, thank you for uh, staying for the last session. Uh, my sincere thanks to Sham, Rob, Bob, Bang and other organizers, you know, a great group. Uh, uh, I'm honored to be here. So my talk is how to prevent pancreatic necrosis in acute pancreatitis. Uh, these are my disclosures, all uh, federal funding and uh, no industry. <clears throat> so we need to know just one slide. We are all practicing doctors. We don't want to go into basic sciences, but the pathogenesis of necrosis and acute pancreatitis inflammation is Trypsinogen gets activated to trypsin, which activates all other enzymes and then auto-digestion of the gland. There is also co-localization of enzymes in lysosomes, which favors inflammation and necrosis. The cytokines are the players, the bad players, uh, which cause all this damage, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, 6, 8, platelet-activating factor, and nuclear factor, kappa B and also mitochondrial dysfunction, which is recently being discussed as an important event, which causes impaired autophagy. So finally, what happens is necrosis. When, ne when necrosis is more than the programmed cell death, which is apoptosis, that's when necrotizing pancreatitis ensues. This much is enough for us to understand. But if you look at the acute pancreatitis overall, and the morphologic classification and severity classification. Morphologic is interstitial and necrotizing. Necrotizing is what we are interested in today, approximately 75-25%, both of them. But they also correspond roughly to the severity revised classification of Atlanta. Uh, I'm also part of that. Uh, most of the interstitial morphologic are actually severity-wise mild, and the deaths are less than 1%. But in the necrotizing pancreatitis, 15 to 20% are moderately severe, and 5 to 10% with persistent organ failure are severe, where the deaths gradually go, go up. This is the correlation between morphologic and uh, severity classifications. So there are three types of necrotizing pancreatitis. When we say pancreatic necrosis, pure pancreatic necrosis that you see on the CT scan is extremely rare. You have to understand that. It's only about 0.5, 0.6%. Whereas the combined pancreatic and peripancreatic is the commonest probably. Uh, equally common is the isolated peripancreatic necrosis, where the pancreas gland itself looks normal. It is important to recognize these things because the outcomes of isolated peripancreatic necrosis are slightly better than the usual combination of pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis. This is from a large uh, consecutive uh, sample of 639 from our Dutch friends. So 
the first 72 hours you know is a golden period, probably the first 24 hours even more, where you have to do some things to actually improve the outcomes of acute pancreatitis. And here, when we have to consider what we can do to prevent necrosis, you must know that necrosis gets established by day three to day five. Many times you do day one CT, it will be interstitial, the patient doesn't do well, day three, day four, you get a repeat CT scan, there is necrosis. So assuming that it happens at three to five, you have a window of probably 24 to 72 hours. So the IV fluids, early enteral nutrition, early ERCP for predicted severe biliary pancreatitis, and a drug therapy if you have one. These are the four things that we can look at if they actually decrease this necrosis which you see uh, at uh, day five. Um, but one thing I want to tell you here, you have hundreds of systems, markers, et cetera, et cetera, for predicting the severity. In 2021, we do not have a good system to predict. So you can forget all those systems that you read, bicep, this sap, that sap, et cetera. So, First, we talk about the IV fluids. The basis behind IV hydration, as you know, is the third spade losses because of the inflammation, the pancreas sweeps into the pancreas, peripancreatic tissue, ascites, pleural effusion, so on and so forth. Then you get hemoconcentration, which is, you know, hematocrit more than 44%. But the problem here is the chicken and the egg sort of problem. Is hemoconcentration just a surrogate finding in a patient where the disease is already going into necrosis, or hemoconcentration happens because of third space losses, and then it causes necrotizing pancreatitis. We don't know that. So this causes impaired microcirculation, then reduced perfusion, then ischemia of the pancreas, peripancreatic tissues, and you get the necrotizing pancreatitis. So the important factors in IV hydration, because this is the only treatment we have right now, is the type of fluid, the rate at which you give, the total volume of the fluid, the timing when you start, and the duration for which you give the IV fluids, and how do you monitor these people? Clinical monitoring, hematocrit, blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, these can be done twice a day, urine output, hourly urine output, and then CVP, mean arterial pressure if they are in the ICU. That is the called the goal-directed, how do you monitor these? These are the issues here. But, you know, many times the theory and practice are so different. When you actually start looking at the data, at the only effective therapy we have. So many publications and trials have been done. When we did the technical review for AGA, uh, published in 2018, we found that there is no evidence to suggest any of the previous things that I mentioned about the rate and the total volume and the timing and et cetera. There is no evidence for any of those things. And even there is no evidence that actually it decreases the adverse outcomes, particularly the important adverse outcomes like necrosis, organ failure, and death. There are some surrogate benefits of decreasing the CRP and SIRS, but not the important hard clinical outcomes which you and I are interested in the clinic. So this is the, after uh, that review, this is the most recent 2021 randomized controlled trial of lactate drinker versus normal saline from Jim Buxbaum from uh, USC. Even here, there is no improvement in necrosis, but there is improvement in the ICU need and hospital stay with lactate drinker. At least there is some trend that is coming, but for necrosis, we still don't have anything. So if you, the experts and guidelines, that is why I recommend for the IV fluid therapy that three to five ml per kilogram per hour or 250 to 350 mil per hour, that's number one. Lactate drinker, I think now we are all giving lactate drinker. Timing, you have to immediately start the moment you make the diagnosis. Monitoring clinical hematocrit, BUN, creatinine, urine output are as good as any of the sophisticated ICU stuff. And do not give the IV fluid therapy beyond 36, 48 hours. That's when you actually start overloading them and giving them complications. So by that time, they will be starting to take by mouth and you know you can back off on this. So this is about the IV fluid, no benefit for necrosis. Then we go to the next one, uh, which is enteral nutrition. So the rationale here is by giving enteral nutrition, you're protecting the gut mucosal integrity so that the bacteria that are present in the gut do not get translocated and go to, infected, uh, to infect the necrosis. And it's also supposed to reduce the inflammatory cytokines. And it's supposed to reduce, in, in theory, in animal experiments, the necrosis and the infected pancreatic necrosis. But 
when we looked at the, all the studies that have been done, including the most recent, uh, including the, the early, uh, in the first 24 hours, uh, giving internal nutrition for predicted severe pancreatitis patients by the Dutch group again, there is no superiority of starting it early. Two, it did not actually improve the necrosis. In both the groups, early uh, feeding as well as the late feeding in which most of the people actually took by mouth, necrosis is still 60%. So this has not helped either. Uh, but we have to say that uh, the oral and enteral nutrition, uh, by giving by mouth, we have reduced the rate of interventions for acute pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, and no type of feeding has actually any effect on decreasing necrosis, whether it is by mouth, liquid diet, solid diet, low-fat diet, you know, tube feeding, etc. But the infected necrosis part by enteral feeding has come down, so there is some benefit, but not on the actual necrosis. Then we come to the ERCP, especially in biliary pancreatitis. By doing the early ERCP in predicted severe biliary pancreatitis, can we prevent the, inf the necrotizing pancreatitis day three, day five? Once again, the Dutch study, uh, I'm sorry, everything is Dutch, 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 but uh, those are the people. So the Lancet, they clearly showed when they took the predicted severe and did the early versus, you know, after three days or within the same admission, no decrease as far as necrosis is concerned. So even that doesn't uh, help necrosis. So lastly, the drugs. Doing a drug trial is very difficult. Uh, uh, you know, there are no drug trials in acute pancreatitis in the last 50 years, except two, both from our center. One was a pilot study with pentoxifilin we published in 2015 gastro. There was some slight benefit of predicted severe patients if you give, as far as necrosis is concerned. But when we did the same drug, larger study, NIH sponsored, no benefit. So there are so many negative trials in the last 50 years, RCTs with all these drugs, so none of them uh, have helped. But there are the, some positive trials, and all of them are from China, Japan, Korea, uh, that part of the world, not in the Western world, and they have been you know, various drugs that you can see. But there are so many methodologic issues with every uh, study, every drug, every uh, agent, that you know, we didn't even try replicating those studies here. So that's uh, uh, the problem. Currently, we have been just funded by the Department of Defense to try perfenidone, the drug that is uh, used in uh, pulmonary fibrosis for the last five years, because it has significant uh, benefit in uh, acute pancreatitis, preventing the necrosis in, uh, in uh, animal models. So we are going to start that study in about uh, 10 to 12 months. The funding has just come. So. Lastly, the ERCP pancreatitis. Prevention of necrotizing post-ERCP pancreatitis, we have some good news here at least. You know that there are so many treatments that have come to reduce the post-ERCP pancreatitis, and the most recent network meta-analysis looked at 38 RCTs and 10 different interventions, and rectal indomethacin, diclofenac, pancreatic stents, aggressive hydration, sublingual nitrate, all are useful, but the most important thing is we have many agents which are useful to prevent post-ERCP pancreatitis, and probably hydration and indomethacin is the best uh, for all comers if you are giving them. But in people with high risk factors to get PEP, then probably it's the pancreatic stent. But the most important thing is almost the necrotizing pancreatitis post-ERCP with all these things is so rare Maybe at least we have some good news where we can prevent necrosis. I'm not going into the cost problems of indomethacin availability making in your pharmacy. That's totally outside the purview of this talk. So the take home points for uh, preventing necrosis is necrosis may take three to five days. So wait for three to five days to document a case as necrotizing or non-necrotizing. Isolated peripancreatic necrosis has better outcomes than combined pancreatic and peripancreatic. Both are seen roughly equal 50-50. IV hydration is the established, established treatment, but how, why, what, when, we are still not clear, unfortunately. Probably lactated drinker is the only thing that we are clear. Um, essentially, IV hydration, urgent enteral nutrition, and ERCP early for predicted biliary pancreatitis, we are not able to prevent necrosis. So we are all waiting for a drug to treat acute pancreatitis and prevent necrosis. At least in post-ERCP pancreatitis, we have some, uh, we have made progress and we can probably say that we have decreased. So 
hopefully better studies and better drugs will come and then uh, we can get to something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. So um, Anne-Marie is, uh, is one of my most favorites. Uh, Anne-Marie came from England uh, to do advanced endoscopy at Hopkins. And fast forward, I was around the same time at UAB after my fellowship. I came to work for Rob Haas, and Anne-Marie is the chief of gastroenterology at Hopkins. She runs a very, very successful division. Um, she's got many star faculty. I would really encourage you to go to YouTube and I think listen to one of her uh, lectures on uh, personalized medicine because my wife from India called and told me, listen, I wanted to see how you can speak and do you know this person? And I said, of course I know Anne-Marie. And she's also a prolific writer. Um, recently she contributed a textbook chapter on pancreatic cysts and I, it was an assignment to all my faculty that they should read this chapter because it was like a Shakespeare's poetry. I'm pretty critical with my edits. You can't put a, add a semicolon or a full stop. So this is uh, your flawless Anne-Marie. Thanks so much for joining us, and good morning, Anne-Marie. Uh, thank, thank you very much. You're making me blush. Um, so th I, want to thank the, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It is a great pleasure to be here, and also for all of you for being here on a Sunday morning. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes, I noticed it was only 15 minutes, are three things. Number one, I'm going to try to answer the question, what is all the fuss about pancreatic cysts? Number two, we're going to take a case, and I hope that at the end of it, when you see a patient, you're going to have a good idea about how to manage the patient. And then finally, I'd like to talk very briefly about what's new in pancreatic cysts and where is the future. So I have no relevant disclosures. So let's talk about, let's ask, answer the question that I was said, what is all the fuss about? And the fuss is to do with pancreatic cancer. So currently, pancreatic cancer is the third commonest cause of death due to cancer in the United States, and it is predicted to be the second commonest cause of death due to cancer by the end of, the, of this decade. So by 2030, pancreatic cancer will become the second commonest cause of death. The overall survival uh, at the moment in the United States is 10.8%, so almost 90% of patients who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will die. If you look at the European data, the survival is 5%. So, should we stick our head in the sand and give up? Well, the answer is it's not all doom and gloom. There is some light at the end of the tunnel. This is a study from Japan, and it looked at early stage, very early stage pancreatic cancer. But what you can see is that if you can detect pancreatic cancer early enough, at stage, either at high grade dysplasia or stage 1A, at 10 years, you have an 80 to 94% survival. And so the problem with pancreatic cancer is we're detecting it too late, and it is curable if we can detect it early. So what's all the fuss about pancreatic cysts? Well, it's to do with this. How do you detect pancreatic cancer earlier? There are three precursors to pancreatic cancer, two of which, mucinous cystic neoplasms and intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms are pancreatic cysts. Every day our colleagues in the emergency room are detecting these because they're doing CT scans on every single person who comes in. Uh, I want to thank them for keeping us in business. Uh, so this is an, an incredible opportunity. But of course, life is never that simple. So let's talk about what are the challenges about this and how do you manage these patients. So you go home today, and in a week's time, week in, a week and a day, you're in clinic. And at 11 a.m., this lady comes in to see you. She's 52 years of age. She had, an incidental she had a CT scan done by our colleagues in the emergency room and had an incidental finding of a pancreatic cyst. She has no GI symptoms, no history of diabetes, pancreatitis. The cyst is 2.7 centimeters. It's in the head of the pancreas. It appears to communicate with the main pancreatic duct, which measures three millimeters per the radiology report. And the radiologist says they think it's a serous cyst. So what we're going to see is, are they correct? And what should we do about the patient? So let's start off with what are the tools that you have? How good are MRI? Is there anything else that we should do? And how do you interpret the results? So when I look at a patient with a pancreatic cyst, there's two questions I want to answer. Number one, what type of cyst do that patient have? And number two, um, if they have an IPMN or an MCN, do they have high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer? Because that will allow us, that will categorize us into patients who have got no malignant potential, where we can say goodbye, we don't need to follow you, patients with 
cystic degeneration of a cancer who clearly need to be sent to a surgeon or an oncologist, and then our two precancerous lesions, most of which can be followed and a very small number of whom will need surgery. So we, saw, we said this lady came in with, with, a CT, with a CT scan, and almost everybody's going to come in with cross-sectional imaging. So how good is it? And the answer is it's good for identifying high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer, but if you look at a systematic review and meta-analysis, the, the, the uh, accuracy for telling you exactly what type of cyst you have is 40 to 50%. So it's good, but it's not perfect. So I think we should take that. It's a serous cyst with a, little, with a pinch of salt. So what else do we have? Well, we have endoscopic ultrasound, and we have some of the top endosonographers in the world here with us today. So what are the pros and cons of this? Well, one is it, the downside is it's invasive. So what are the benefits of doing it? Well, number one, it's the best test for picking up a lump or a solid component. And if you find that, you can tell your patients that they have a 9.3 odds ratio of having high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer. The second thing is you, it allows you to stick a needle into the cyst and take the fluid out. And here on the right, you can see the big black thing is the cyst, and the white thing with the arrow is a needle in the middle of it. And you can take the fluid out, and this is my cheat sheet for you of, of how to interpret the, the fluid, the results when it gets sent to you. And I'm happy to share my slides with anybody afterwards. So first thing, if you look at the CEA, if it's low, less than five, then you classically see this in a serous cyst or a pseudo cyst. If it's high, which we define as greater than 192, you start thinking about an IPMN or an MCN. Secondly, you're going to look at the cytology result. If you see mucin, you're going to think about an IPMN or an MCN. You're also going to look to see was there any high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer, because that's clearly going to change your management. And then finally, we, people are sending molecular markers more and more. So how do you interpret these? They're really simple. If you see a thing called GNAS, that tells you your patient's got an IPMN. If you see KRAS, they could have either an IPMN or an MCN. Um, and then, and then I'll, I'll give you a pearl a little later on about, about how to deal with cirrhosis and, and that. So I'm not going to talk about pseudocysts because I think everybody is very comfortable about dealing with them, but I'm going to talk about cirrhosis. These are the commonest benign cysts after pseudocysts. Two-thirds of them occur in women. Classically, they can present in their 50s, but like everything in life, they can present at any stage. They are usually single. They usually have no connection or communication between the cyst and the pancreatic duct. If you're lucky, you'll have this classic image, which consists of multiple tiny cysts, which we call a microcystic appearance, with a central scar, but that occurs in less than 30% of people. We've spoken about the cyst fluid analysis. The really important thing about serous cysts is that the risk of cancer there are four cases ever reported in the world. So basically, these are non-cancerous cysts, and they require no surveillance. One of the things I find very challenging is that patients do not believe you, and they won't. You say, hey, I don't need to see you again. You don't need any follow-up. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. You need to see me. You need to keep following me. Well, I think one of the interesting and helpful things that has come recently is that there was a large study, and it showed that if you had a VHL mutation, so that's those molecular markers come back, and you have a VHL mutation with no other mutation, you can tell your patient with 100% specificity that they have a serous cyst, and they do not need to see you again. So we did an EUS FNA. Here's the result, CEA 354. And if you remember, we said classically the CEA is low in patients with cirrhosis. So if we go back to our diagram, I think we can cross this out. I think we're, this is not what we're dealing with. So let's look at the far right. Are we dealing with pancreatic cancer? And can these, how do these present as cysts? So here's a cyst. If you see here, there's a big black thing. It looks like a cyst. That's wonderful. But as you scroll through, you can see there's a large solid component. And both pancreatic uh, adenocarcinomas and neuroendocrine tumors can both present as cysts because you get cystic degeneration as the center rapidly grows. The management for these are very simple. You should refer to a high volume center. And again, it's very important that the people you refer to do a lot of operations because there is a significant difference in mortality of 5 to 8 percent depending on the experience of your surgeon. So refer to a high volume center. Well, we did a biopsy. Uh, there is no, as you saw on the cyst, there's no evidence of solid component. There was no high grade dysplasia or invasive cancer. So I think we can exclude this. So we're down to two options. Anybody voting on which they think it is? No? It's a, very exciting. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, let's talk about mucinous cystic neoplasms. These are so simple. They're really, they're unique. Okay, how are they unique? One, they occur almost exclusively in women. Two, they're almost, they're always single cysts. Three, they almost always occur in the body and tail of the pancreas. So if you have a male, or you have multiple cysts, or you have a cyst in the head, this is not a mucinous cystic neoplasm. They classically have no connection between the cyst and the main pancreatic duct, and that's how we typically try to differentiate them between IPMNs and MCNs, but that's not a great test. They have a high cis fluid CEA, mucin, and will have a KRAS mutation. The risk of cancer is 4 to 12%. So again, take home message, most people with MCNs will not get pancreatic cancer. And there was a recent systematic review of meta-analysis which saw, found that there were no cases of cancer in MCNs less than 3 centimeters which had no concerning features. And therefore, the guidelines really are changing, and now most people will say it's difficult to confidently differentiate a single cyst, a single MCN from a single IPMN in the body or tail, and we really now, most groups will follow them as IPMNs. Well, if you recall, this lady's cyst was in the head of the pancreas. So given that, I think that this, although she's a woman and it's a single cyst, I think that this is very unlikely to be an MCN. So let's talk about IPMNs, what are they, and most importantly, how do we manage them? So when you see a patient with an IPMN, the first thing you want to decide is which of the three subtypes are you dealing with? So is the main pancreatic duct enlarged or dilated? We define that as five millimeters. You remember this lady's was three millimeters, so hers is normal. So a main duct IPMN has a dilated pancreatic duct with no cysts. A mixed type IPMN has a dilated pancreatic duct with cysts. And the reason that these are important is because the presence of a dilated pancreatic duct increases your risk of high-grade dysplasia or cancer. And these are patients that you want, to you want to send for a discussion about, do you watch them carefully or do you need to consider surgery? And I'd be happy to talk about that more um, in the question and answer session. So if you recall, this lady has a normal pancreatic duct, so she has a branch duct IPMN. These occur equally in men and women. They can be found anywhere in the pancreas, and 40% are multiple. They classically have a connection or a communication between the duct and the pancreatic cyst, and we've spoken about the cyst fluid analysis. They have malignant potential, but most people with these will not develop pancreatic cancer. And so one of the things I try to tell my patients is they're much more likely to die with their pancreatic cyst or their IPMN than of their IPMN. So the big question, how do we follow these pa patients? And there are many different guidelines. And again, I think Santhi and I would be happy to discuss this later if you'd like us to. Um, but I think the most important thing is almost all the recommendations or the data that we have to make those guidelines is low or very low quality. And therefore, no matter what, which guideline you read, ultimately, these are expert opinions because we don't have the data to make high quality level one decisions. So I'm going to give you an approach to, to do it, which I think is a reasonable approach. So you have your patient with an IPMN. The first question is, what size is your cyst? If you have a small cyst less than a centimeter, you're going to see the patient back in two years. If it's one to two centimeters, you're going to see them in a year. If it's big, two to three, you're going to bring them back in six months. And you see, I've color coded them. So if it's gray, you're going to use an MRI. And if, you're, if it's in orange, you can use either an MRI or an NEUS. Okay, what about, when, when, when should you have a red flag? Well, you should, these are red flags for you. So if your patient comes in with jaundice secondary to the cyst, acute pancreatitis secondary to the cyst, an elevated CA99, on imaging you've got a lump, a solid component, the pancreatic duct is enlarged, or the cyst is large, and there's a lot of debate about do we use three or four centimeters, or of course the cytology shows high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer, you need to refer to a multidisciplinary group for further evaluation. They don't have to go to surgery, but at least the, you should start the discussion. Do we watch them carefully? Do we operate? A lower level of concern is if they have new onset diabetes or rapid increase in cyst size, and in those cases, we do a short interval follow-up at six months. And finally, patients aged 75, this is a good time to talk about do you continue surveillance or not? What about after they go to resection? The only cysts that need follow-up are IPMNs. So let's, fin to finish up, what's new? 
There are some very, so the tools that we have are imperfect and there's some very exciting new tools for endosonographers so we can stick a tiny, a tiny uh, forceps into the center of the cyst and try and get a better sample and this is very exciting and many of us are doing this. We can also put a tiny microscope which will give us live imaging of the inside of the, of the cyst and we now have had seven prospective trials and, most, and they show that it has a high sensitivity and specificity for identifying IPMNs and MCNs from other types of cysts, specifically serous cysts. The molecular markers are also getting better. So this is a study that was in gut by Atra Singh in the group from Pittsburgh. And what they show is that you can identify uh, with 79% sensitivity and 96% specificity high-grade displays in invasive cancer. And so this is really very exciting. So what about the future? At the moment, we're, you're going to go home and you're going to say, hey, what size is the cyst? You're going to see you in six months or I'll see you in two years. We really need things that are better. So I hope for the future, it's going to look very, very different. We're going to be able to say to patients, not only one, do you have an IPMN or an MCN, but secondly, where are you in this progression? Do you have features of low-grade displays, in which case we don't need to see you for many, many years, or are you at a higher level? In addition, there are now developments where people are, are doing, we're developing vaccines, so you could intervene early to stop the progression. So hopefully that people, you don't need to worry about where they are, but you might actually be able to prevent pancreatic cancer. So thank you so much and I appreciate your time. That was fantastic, Anne-Marie. So we're gonna go back to Shanti and uh, ask him to educate us about chronic pancreatitis. I'm sure all of us have seen these patients, except that we don't know what to do with them. So he will give us an evidence-based approach to treating these patients. Thank you again, Shyam. Uh, so when you see a patient with chronic pancreatitis, all of you must be seeing so many. What are all the worries that we face? Pain, pain, and pain. That's the biggest problem. And half a billion dollars every year are spent on the pain for these people. And exocrine insufficiency is the next one, which leads to weight loss and leads to nutritional deficiencies. Then the diabetes, which has its own uh, problems. And more important is the low quality of life, high resource utilization, and disability of these patients. So the pain and weight loss in chronic pancreatitis are somewhat interrelated. Because of pain and cytophobia, that is uh, fear to eat, and the narcotic bowel most of them have, they eat less and less, and the weight loss is actually compounded in addition to the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and maldigestion that these people have. So the pain is what the first part of our discussion, and I have a classification of pain in my practice. The first one is attacks of pain. So these people don't have any intervening pain, but they have distinct uh, painful attacks. They can be either frank acute pancreatitis or they may not be acute pancreatitis, but you think they are acute pancreatitis, but when you check the enzymes and the imaging, it's not there. So those are the attacks. Then you get chronic pain at some point of time in the first uh, one to two years. This is usually upper abdominal, and it may be either type 1, Aman, he's uh, the one first who started talking about pain way back, here you have intermittent attacks, but long periods with no pain. And then you have the other one where most of the time they may have pain in the upper abdomen. But most of us in the tertiary center see the third type, that is chronic, chronic pain, I call it. Here the people have 24-7 pain. Quite often they are on narcotics. Quite often they are more than six months uh, narcotic use. And they say that hardly ever the pain goes away. This is, of course, an extremely difficult problem because this pain now clearly tells you it is a neuropathic process, central and peripheral sensitization. No matter what structural interventions you do, endoscopic, surgical, etc., there is a high chance of failure. So... The pain patterns have been very clearly studied once again by my Dutch uh, friends, and they followed consecutively uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis patients, and he, they have clearly shown 50% have continuous pain, 20% have intermittent pain, and actually almost 30% have no pain. These people are called the so-called painless pancreatitis, late onset uh, painless pancreatitis. So why do these people have pain, the mechanisms for pain? Ductal hypertension, 
because of the stone structures, dilated ducts, there is hypertension giving rise to pain. Parenchymal hypertension, which we call compartment syndrome because of this fibrosis, etc., compressing the nerves. Then over a period of time, the pancreatic neuritis develops, the nerves get hypertrophied and also proliferate in numbers within the pancreas. And complications of CP, like cancer, stenosis of the bile duct, pancreatic duct stricture, duodenal stricture, and pseudosis, they can all cause pain. So these are some of the explanations that we normally give. But recently, experts started saying, this is the most important concept for continuous pain in chronic pancreatitis, which I want you to be very familiar with. The pancreatic neuropathy is where the nerves proliferate, both in size and number. Then the peripheral and central sensitization starts. What do you mean by that? The afferent tracts going into the posterior columns and the spinothalamic tracts in the posterior column going to the sensory cortex and the descending inhibitory pathways. These all become abnormal by sophisticated neuro neurologic studies, PET MRIs, and the nerve conduction, etc. You can s clearly show that these have been deranged. And here the pain is coming from that process. So if you see a stricture or a stone or something and you do endoscopic intervention or surgery, including total pancreatectomy or cell transplantation, they will still come back with the same pain. So this is extremely important to understand this. Um, so for the pain relief, this is the first half of the talk, and uh, I'll try to finish it within 15 minutes. We start with tramadol and NSAIDs. Then pancreatic enzymes, meta-analysis clearly showed that they do not have any effect on reducing the pain. But some recent studies showed that they may. But more important is the discomfort these people have because of maldigestion, like bloating, cramping, borborygmoid, that part will be benefited, and so there will be some role for this. Antioxidants is very important, no downside to it, not expensive. I'll talk a little more about it. But I want to caution the opioids because most of the people that we see, they're all, almost all of them are on opioids. But here, when you start a patient because you're helpless and uh, you have to start them. I think it is very soon you should refer them to an expert center for them to see the treatments below the line that I have given. Endoscopic, surgical, islet cell transplantation, celiac block, I put two question marks because evidence is not strong, and some stray evidence for acupuncture and spinal cord stimulation. But the pain management becomes extremely important, pain rehabilitation, neuromodulators, for those people who come with continuous pain to us. So it is important for us to see the specialist centers, people at an earlier stage where the endoscopic surgical things can be done. So early referral becomes extremely important. The antioxidants, I'm just, because this will be good for your practice, they decrease the oxidative stress, which is a mechanism for inflammation. Vitamin A, C, E, selenium, methionine, and zinc. These are the antioxidants that these people should get. The fixed dose stuff are not freely available in the United States, but in UK and Europe, they do that. Meta-analysis clearly showed that they benefit the patients for pain with or without pregabalin. Meta-analysis is there too. So what we do in our clinic is the simple thing, natural form, colored vegetables, both for lunch and dinner, berries every day, one to two tablespoons, and centrum silver uh, with multi uh, uh, with minerals. This is what uh, we give, and it has other benefits too. Now, the next uh, thing for the pain is the endoscopic therapy. So you have beautiful guidelines by the ESGE. If you have stones with a stricture, particularly if the stones are more than five millimeters, you need as well. And I think you are going to set up as well, you know, the thing. The problem is not many centers have as well, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And then if they're less than five millimeters, just by ERCP and, you know, stone breaking down, structure dilatation can be done. A dominant structure of main pancreatic duct should be dilated for at least one year with 10 French plastic stent. And you have to, in between, do the uh, stent exchanges so that it doesn't get clogged, even if the patient is asymptomatic. Self-expandable metal stents have been, are being used very frequently, but still they're off-label. And in a recent meta-analysis, they have more adverse outcomes, although the efficacy is same. 
Uh, Pseudo-Sham has shown long time ago by a fantastic RCT from uh, Birmingham that it is better to do it endoscopically than surgery by transmural pigtail with or without transpapillary. And for biliary structures, which happen in 5 to 25 percent, called the entrapment, biliary entrapment. I don't want to go into the biliary because we have an expert here. But you have to keep them expanded, the structures, with multiple plastic stents or SEMs. Then the EUS guided celiac block is better than percutaneous block, although the efficacy is only 50% and you may have to give repeated blocks and it is still, there is no level one evidence comparing this to anything else. Then we go to surgery for pain in chronic pancreatitis. There have been two randomized controlled trials which showed surgery is better. The endoscopists have torn, have torn those uh, papers apart saying there are so many methodologic issues. And also, you have to understand the patient would first like to go for an endoscopic therapy and not pancreatic surgery. And most of the physicians, even gastroenterologists and even specialists, would like to first consider endoscopic therapy. So this is the real world thing. But the most recent better conducted study, by, once again by the Dutch group, I'm sorry, I don't have any, I'm not on their payroll to, to, <laughs> to uh, present these things, but they have... They have done this study much more uh, uh, in a sophisticated manner because the earlier studies have been criticized by endoscopy guys, and they said that in 18 months follow-up, certainly the pain relief is better with surgery. So that's where we are, and the surgical procedures are usually resection or uh, drainage procedures, and then total pancreatectomy with islet cell uh, transplantation. So just only a few important procedures. Pustos is a longitudinal pancreatic jejunostomy, which is on the right side. And then, uh, sorry, uh, and here you have a cyst jejunostomy, which we don't do any more surgery after Sham's paper. And uh, the pylorus preserving ripple is particularly done when the disease is mostly in the head. It is called head centric chronic pancreatitis, also called groove pancreatitis, with duodenal stenosis, bile duct stenosis, inflammation between the head of the pancreas and the groove of the duodenum, and they get repeated attacks of these things. And even if you don't think there is uh, cancer, still I think you may have to do a ripple for them. And the duodenum preserving pancreatic head resection is what most commonly done in the United States. Dr. Fry, who used to attend the meeting still about five, six years ago, when he reached 90s, he stopped. He's from California. He, you core out all the fibrotic process in the head and the stones, split open the pancreatic duct, and do pusto on that. That's called Fry's procedure. And total pancreatectomy, one or two uh, slides. It is being advocated vigorously, and more and more centers are joining the bandwagon. Open access is being provided. Even for minimal change disease, it is being done. I don't know what minimal change disease. Sometimes I think it's irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, earlier referral is being requested because the islet yield, they say, as you go f further, it comes down. We ran it for 10 years and we closed because we thought that very few people need it, and uh, we stopped that. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, well, the <laughs> So when should TPIAT be done? Uh, I'm sorry, the it's, uh, no. spelling is not correct. I think it has to be done only as a study protocol, not as an established practice. Uh, and then also, considering the fact that insulin independence is only in 20 to 30 percent at the end of three years, and you're taking a non-diabetic patient and you give the patient insulin after you know 70 percent chance after three years, you have to justify why you are doing this procedure. And 30 percent of those people still require narcotics because we have caught them at the neuropathic process where this is not going to work. So if you look at the, if you look at the anatomy based, if you have a dilated head Without, uh, if you have a head mass without a dilated duct, you can do Whipple. If you have a head mass with a dilated Whipple, you can either do Fry or Whipple. If you have dense calcifications and also dilated duct with intraductal calcifications, you can do Fry, where you can core out all these calcifications. Single stone, dilated PD, you can do as well with or without ERCP. And if you have a non-dilated duct uh, and you know, small duct disease, chronic pancreatitis, you can do what's called a V-shaped pancreatic ojojinostomy and possibly sometimes TPIAT. So I think I need to rush now because now we will go to the weight loss, consequences of exocrine insufficiency, weight loss, sarcopenia, steatoria, fat-soluble vitamins and micronutrients, zinc, magnesium, B12 deficiency. Osteopathy is a term that's being used by 
people uh, more and more now, osteoporosis and osteopenia. And also there is an all-cause mortality increase in patients with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Diagnosing is actually clinical steatoria is pretty good. Most of the people bring you the photos of the oil droplets. Then the golden test, gold standard is still the fecal fat, 24, 48, 72 hours, whatever. If you don't have it, please send it to the nearest lab because it can be mailed. Uh, I think you should convince your patient. And it's become a fashion to do fecal elastase by all of us because it's simple, simple, cheap, and many of the pancreas specialists are also advocating. It has a lot of issues. I cannot go into the details. Sensitivity specificity is low. Cannot detect mild to moderate steatoria, And it can be positive in a variety of things. And particularly when the stool is very liquid, it's going to be false positive. Secretin MRCP is coming more and more to detect exocrine insufficiency. Hopefully next year we will have C13 triglyceride breath test. And the tube tests have almost disappeared, even in those centers where the endoscopic secretin test, uh, there are people who want to do it, but because of the time requirement and lack of referrals, it is actually dying down, I think. Um, this is the MRCP where you can actually see with secretin the duodenal filling, and you can quantify how much of the duodenum is filled, and you can grade them into one, two, three, exocrine insufficiency. And lastly, the most important thing is pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy for the weight loss in these people. The landmark paper is by DiMagno from uh, Mayo Clinic where he said 90% destruction should be there to get diabetes and uh, exocrine insufficiency. And the lipase units, you need to know that the United States pharmacopoeia units that we use here uh, is one international unit is three USP, and we use USP here, so we need to know that. And most of the guidelines recommend 40 to 50,000 USP units lipase with each meal and maybe half with a snack. So what we do is we start with 10,000 USP units, three capsules with each meal, one at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. The spreading over uh, colleagues from Spain have shown is the best way to do it. And uh, we have to make sure they're actually taking it. We can go up to 72,000 units and beyond that, it won't help the patient, but it will help the pharma pharmaceutical company. If there's no improvement, you can add PPI, even to coated enzymes which you have, because that would probably make some difference. If still no improvement, check for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And if it is present, very common in these people to have it because, you know, the, the, uh, because of the pH that is there in these people. And if no improvement, then we have to actually check the diagnosis of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And most important is do not restrict fats in these people because that's one of the most important reasons for weight loss and essential fatty acid deficiency. There is no need to restrict fats at all in chronic pancreatitis patients, and you can actually give enzymes and see that they have the thing. You have these pre uh, preparations in the market, but Viacase, which is the only uncoated thing, is no longer available, so all we have is coated preparations, five of them. So what enzymes can do is they help weight loss, like I told you. They decrease the discomfort due to bloating and cramping. There is some evidence they may reduce the pain recently, but they have no effect on osteopathy or mortality, and they're very expensive. Don't forget, it. they cost 300 to $500 every month. So I think that's what I do for weight loss and uh, pain, and I'm sorry that I cramped too many slides and may have cut into the next one. Thank you. Thank you. You, you, you talked a lot about uh, cerebral stimulation and the nervous system. I don't know how many of us have got it in our heads, uh, but we will try to get you the slides. I think this was very, very valuable information, so I'll just make sure that each of you have access. And the last speaker is Professor Steve Edmundovics. He's a very, very good friend of uh, my partner, Rob Haas. They go a very long way. So all the young faculty uh, in uh, advanced endoscopy who desire, who desire a career have all migrated to Colorado, and there's a reason. <laughs> uh, because of the stars of endoscopy in the United States uh, actually have been trained by him. Uh, Greg Cote, and yesterday we heard Sachin Vani. I'm, I've never worked for Steve, but I was told that he's just an awesome uh, uh, division chief. They say he's, he's, he runs a fantastic division, and, and people are very fortunate to work for him. So welcome, Steve, and please educate us on a big controversy in ERCPs, single-use duodenoscopes. 
So, uh, Cheyenne, thank you, uh, Rob. Thank you very much. I'm humbled to be here, and it's really uh, been a great meeting. And I, I'm sorry I got here late. I had some issues with my family that we had to take care of, and I'm very happy to, to see all of you this morning, and thank you for staying. This is a very interesting topic, uh, not just for the ERCPs in the audience, but this is going to be a topic that will affect all of us that practice gastroenterology in the future. And I'm really giving this talk more to open your eyes as to what's happening uh, in our world. Uh, these are my disclosures. I do consult with a lot of the endoscopic companies, so I, I, th I think I have a good sense of what's going on uh, in this space, and I don't expect any of this to affect my opinions that I'm going to share with you this morning. So what is the problem with ERCP and infections? It's that there was a history of scope-transmitted ERCP infections that was detected way back in the 80s. We knew that uh, improper uh, hanging of the scopes would lead to pseudomonas infections. We had Klebsiella infections. But what really became apparent in the 2014-15 era is these new microbiological characterization techniques that could tell where the bacteria came from. And more importantly, that the bacteria that infected patient A was actually the same bacteria that was infecting patient B 10 days before. And that's what led to this really huge alert of what's going on with these reusable endoscopes. We're reprocessing them, we're trying to eliminate all of the bacterial contamination, and we were being unsuccessful. Now, this led to some significant problems. Uh, there was a great focus on reprocessing errors, human factors that can contribute to infection transmission. But we now understand that the infection transmission can occur even when the endoscopes are effectively reprocessed according to the manufacturer's instructions. So there are cases that have been clearly identified that were not due to errors or incomplete uh, handling of the endoscope. This is the, the slide from the FDA summary that occurred back in 2019, and you can see that there was this burst of uh, infectious cases that were reported to them in 2015, slightly less in 2016, but we're going to talk a minute about the MOD database and what its imperfections are for actually being a good way to follow these infections. What was most shocking were the deaths. 2015, 25 reported deaths after uh, ERCP related to infections with multi-drug resistant organisms, even more in 2016. And then you can see that there's been a, a tailing off of the reporting. Now, there could be many reasons for this. I personally believe it's because both CMS, uh, all of the GI societies, the alert went out and people really started to clean up their reprocessing and understood what had to be done to make sure that this didn't happen. But there's also some concerns that maybe it's just being underreported now and that, that they're not getting uh, effective monitoring of this condition. The MOD database, which is what we use to report these things, is really an, a voluntary process. And you can get caught if you don't report a complication. But the reality is there's not much of an enforcement arm related to this. So you really can't use the MOD database as the, the de facto gold standard that we've reduced infections. And in fact, we know that infections are still occurring because we see small numbers of cases being reported. So it doesn't represent all the safety information about ERCP. And we have to be cautious if we're going to use this as our guide. It's really just our alert that something's going on and we need to investigate it more carefully. So I would say that infection transmission at ERCP is real. It is ongoing if you're using reusable scopes. And the detection and reporting is probably incomplete. It's really difficult to estimate what the incidence of this is. I do think it's much lower now. It may be almost, almost unmeasurable, but it still occurs. And you should be aware of it. And in your practice, if you have a patient that develops cholangitis after an ERCP, particularly with a multi-drug resistant organism, you should have a method to identify that scope, get that scope evaluated, get it cultured, make sure that it's not going to infect other patients with the same process. So we isolate those scopes and have them cultured if we see this. So what about, what is the problem with the duodena scope? Well, it's the elevator in the scope that's really the biggest problem because it presents a really special problem in reprocessing and all duodena scopes have elevators. It's very difficult to mechanically clean that mechanism and the organisms that can get established in biofilm can persist through high level disinfection and even sterilization. 
And then we pass devices through that same area into new patients' bile ducts and pancreatic ducts that are supposedly sterile. So we really do set up the, the possibility of developing an infection. And all of you have seen the elevator mechanism and where it's located on the endoscope and how it's really necessary for us to perform biliary and pancreatic procedures. The problem is, is that this mechanism is actually, if you look at the picture in the middle, this is the steel elevator that's been taken out of this endoscope, and I apologize, somebody, this is also from our, our colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, but they actually did an autopsy uh, of their scope that caused uh, uh, infections, and what they found was that it's the, the material that you can't even get at, the O-ring and the other part of the elevator behind the composite of the, of the duodenoscope that had biofilm on it and was likely the source of infection. So this is what led to the design now of taking the cap off and being able to further clean this mechanism. But even that, it's not been proven that it's going to reduce the, uh, the, the number of infections we see. So the FDA was panicked about this. They, they issued a mandate, we want a solution to this problem. And only in America could you have a solution to this problem in five years. It really is. It, it, honestly, quite amazing that this was able to be accomplished. So the single-use duodenoscope, a completely disposable device, actually eliminates the risk of duodenoscope-transmitted infections. Done. Cannot happen. There are ramifications of this, however, and we'll talk about those. The effect is that you can complete almost all ERCP procedures with these disposable scopes. They're not the same as the reusable scopes. They, they don't feel the same. They don't have the best image quality. So you'll definitely notice a difference. But they can be very effective. There are some other issues that are not clear. It's unclear if the scope design with these disposable scopes could lead to a higher incidence of pancreatitis. There doesn't seem to be evidence for that so far, but only a small number of patients have been followed. And it's unclear if these new disposable scopes actually increase repetitive use injuries in the endoscopist, because they are a little harder to work with. The elevator mechanism isn't as smooth. It's a little different. So there's more things that will be followed in this process. This is from a really nice review by uh, uh, G and, and, and Shyam and a colleague from UAB, uh, the pictures of the, the disposable scopes. And they literally are a one-time use instrument that is then taken, and both of these are actually, quote, recycled. But we'll talk about what recycling means, because there's very little parts in these instruments that can be recycled. And for the most part, uh, they're burned. Now, can they be used in cases uh, by everybody? Well, this was a, a, a nice publication that came out this year looking at not only the experts uh, doing ERCP, but also what they would consider less experienced endoscopists. And, and the reality is, is that almost everybody can complete procedures with these cases. You will notice from the second line that there is a crossover rate where you may have to not complete the case with a single-use scope and use a reusable scope. In my opinion, it's a little high <coughs> in this study, and I can't really explain explain that. Uh, I can tell you that the adverse event rate was similar to what we see in our practices. <clears throat> and I can also tell you that there's similar data being generated with the uh, other disposable endoscope. This one was done with the Exalt. <clears throat> the Ambuscope uh, basically has very similar data being generated, though they're behind uh, about a year or two, so that data is not going to be refreshed until DDW and later. What are the advantages of this scope? Well, it does eliminate the infections. It is as effective uh, as a duodenoscope, I will say, in, a, in expert hands and probably in everyone's hands. Uh, there, is a, there are pass-through codes now from Medicare that have actually helped defray the cost of these scopes, because obviously they're more expensive if you're going to be throwing them away every time. Um, and the other advantage that our nurses have really perceived is that there's a procedure turnaround time that's significantly reduced. You're done with the case. Scope goes in the recycling bin, you're ready to do your next case. There's not the five minute in room pre cleaning and then the scope having to be exchanged and going back. The disadvantages are going to be the feel, the cost per procedure, which is going up. Some of the estimates, $700 to over $1,500 per case, depending on who uh, your contract is with and how you're getting these scopes. Uh, and the environmental impact, which uh, we're going to talk about in a little more detail. They're not compatible with any of the current processors you have, so you have to get a processor too. And there's an incomplete line of a disposable scope, so you're going to have to have both reusable and disposable scopes at the same time if you have a multi-purpose GI lab. 
We think there's similar rates of adverse events, but again, more data is needed, and we think there's similar rates of repetitive injuries, but we need more data. There are uh, some advantages to the disposable scopes in that they can probably be customized a little bit, and you'll start to see in the next couple of years different handles, different size wheels for individuals with different size hands, so that may become uh, a factor. How do you incorporate these into your practice? Well, I think if you're a low volume center and you don't have a lot of people taking care of your ERCP fleet and you're worried about this, it's pretty easy because the cost uh, expense increase uh, in that situation probably off is offset significantly by the staff. You need to reprocess the scopes and the training and all the things that have to be done to keep that going. In a moderate volume center, it's a little more uh, of an analysis looking at what your cost for the scopes are and what, what you can get in terms of of uh, uh, the benefits of this. And then in the high volume centers, it's pretty hard to be cost effective because they're very expensive per case. You're doing thousands of cases a year. Uh, but there are some local factors that can help and it depends a little bit on what your economics are and the situation you're in. There's a really nice review by Mark Romsky and uh, Stu Sherman that was just published in GIE. It's actually in press but available on the website. And they talked about how, how they would incorporate these scopes in a big practice. There's clearly patients that they think they would use a single-use uh, duodenoscope on, those that have an active infection, uh, an MDR or other infection, and patients that have a history of recurrent cholangitis. Perhaps they should be the ones that get these scopes. There's also a tier two where you'd consider using the scopes, maybe these high-risk immunocompromised patients, patients with PSC that are gonna get a transplant, those kind of things. And then finally, they, they really feel that these uh, standard cases, stone cases, patients that are healthy and un, not immunocompromised probably don't need this endoscope just yet, though I think there's, there's debate about how you should incorporate this, and there's some ethics about whether you can give it to some people and not to others. Uh, so it becomes very problematic. You'll notice that this triage doesn't include Medicare and the fact that they're going to pay for the scope, whereas other insurances will not pay for it right now. So problem solved, yes, I think the, the infection control problem has been solved with this scope. The design will improve. Every company is working on a disposable duodenoscope right now, so they're only going to get better. And as they get better and more used, the cost will fall. So I think the cost challenge will become less. I think they're going to become the primary duodenoscope in the United States because of the issues I list here. You, you can never eliminate human factors, errors in reprocessing, someone forgets to do a step, someone forgets to actually wash the scope. This is going to eliminate that. It will eliminate the, the transmission risk for the duodenoscope. It also cuts out your need to do scope maintenance and culturing. Most of us are doing that. We're actually maintaining a fleet. We're having them go out for service all the time. We actually have a single person that manages our endoscopes. All of that would be reduced significantly. You don't need sterilization for reusable uh, for these scopes, and it certainly eliminates the training, the certification and monitoring of duodenoscope high-level disinfection, which also now takes another FTE in our practice to just watch the patients that are the, the, the trainees, the techs, that are actually cleaning the duodenoscopes. The true cost analysis for a single-use duodenoscope can, looked at, can be looked at in a number of ways. So there's a purchase price, there's reimbursements that you're going to get from some insurers in Medicare, there's a cost reduction in reprocessing staff, which may be big in your practice or it may be small, depending on if you use those people for other things, and then there's a cost reduction for the hospitalizations that could occur from infections, and there's a cost reduction for lit litigation, which is probably the biggest number that moves a lot of sites to use these instruments. There's a very nice uh, uh, cost analysis that was done by uh, Doss and all, and I listed the, the reference there for you, and my slides will be available available to you if you like them. But it doesn't answer the real question. The last question is, what is the cost to society? This is a very simpleized, simple solution to a problem that is important in the United States, but how is this going to affect the world? And what I really would like you to think about for a minute is single-use duodenoscopes, and more importantly, the progression to single-use endoscopes. What does that mean in terms of waste, pollution, carbon footprint, and to the societies that are gonna benefit from this and what societies are gonna be damaged by this. Because I can guarantee you that these scopes will likely not be produced in the United States and they'll probably be recycled somewhere off-site. And those recyclings will involve pulling a couple of ounces of metal out of the scopes and then destroying the plastic in some way, which will either go to a landfill or be burned. 
So there's a really nice article if you're interested in this topic. Uh, Dapik Agarwal and, and, and Z Tang have done this review talking about sustainability of disposable endoscopes and looking at it not only from an economic factor, but also from environmental and social factors. Who's gonna benefit from this and who are we gonna hurt by this process? And I think if, if you're at all an advocate of this, you wanna look at this for disposable scopes in general, it's definitely worth reading that article. So my question I was posed, is this a solution or an overkill? I think there's no doubt that single-use scopes solve the infection transmission problem. For, from that purpose, it's a solution. They're probably equivalent to the reusable scopes. We need some more data. The cost analysis is complicated and has to be individualized at your center. And the cost of society has to be analyzed in some way. And I can tell you the individuals that are driving this are not interested in doing that. You need to compare single-use disposable cap reusable or other modifications that reduce but do not eliminate the scope transmitted infections. I don't think a removable cap and cleaning is going to eliminate infections, but if it reduces them to such a small level that the cost uh, is, is effective, is that acceptable to our societies? There are some things that we just can't accept. We accept that patients will fall in a hospital sometimes because we can reduce measures so much to protect them, but we can't put someone at their bedside 24 hours a day. So there's a cost that would eliminate all falls, but we're not gonna do that. Is this one of these cases where we should eliminate 90% of the infections and understand that we can't eliminate them all or not? That's a debate that's beyond this forum, but it's certainly something to consider. In terms of solution versus overkill, the FDA, they're looking to solve a problem, right? They don't wanna get nasty letters, they don't want senators investigating them. They've solved the problem now. They said this solves it, we should move towards some kind of reusable, move from reusable to some kind of disposable instrument or parts of instruments. There's some endoscopists that are very much in favor of these devices, and there are some technological things that will advance with the disposable scopes that can advance faster that may be of benefit. Their patients would certainly advocate to have a, a single-use scope. They don't want the risk of an infection. And the endoscope manufacturers are certainly gonna drive this, not only the ones that are producing them now, but every other endoscope manufacturer that sees a business opportunity here. The overkill, I think the environmentalists are very concerned. Uh, this is a big change in our practice, and it's another uh, add to the carbon footprint. It's another add to the waste that we produce. Some endoscopists are very much opposed to these. They feel the train is leaving the station, and we're not really thinking about it well, and we need to think about that. And the insurers obviously don't want to see the costs go up, though you could do the cost analysis and prove to them that maybe the costs won't go up because they're going to eliminate hospital stays or infections. As the experience grows, we're going to have a better understanding of where these duodenoscopes fall in our health system. Uh, for right now, I think it's a very uh, interesting discussion to have. Thank you very much for your attention, and I really appreciate being here today. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, um, thank you, Steve. So, let's go to the last uh, session case presentations. There are just two cases. Uh, this should be fairly quick. So, this is going to be two cases, one of the uh, both, I think, are pancreas. So the first case is very interesting. A 44-year-old woman came to see me in my days in Birmingham, Alabama, for evaluation of a cyst in the head of the pancreas that was found on a CT imaging. Uh, the patient was asymptomatic. Uh, she had no weight loss. She was not a diabetic. The CT actually was done because she had been to the ER uh, somewhere near Montgomery with some abdominal pain, and uh, it revealed a ureteral stone and a small cyst in the pancreas. Past history, as you can see, she was borderline hypertensive, but she was not being treated for it. She had no history of pancreatitis. Surgery, like everybody else, she's got a gallbladder taken out. Uh, family history, there was no history of cancer. She doesn't smoke or drink. Um, uh, she was just on some multivitamins and oral contraceptives. Physical exam was pretty unremarkable. Uh, everything appeared benign. The labs were completely normal, including a liver function panel. Um, there was no prior endoscopic workup. I looked at the CT scan and uh, you know, the read was an 18 millimeter cyst in the pancreatic head. The pancreatic duct was not dilated. They said this could be just a, uh, you know, a benign cyst of the pancreas or maybe a branch duct IPMN. So the patient came to see me. So this was in June uh, 2010. Uh, I think it was about a month after the ASG, after the DDW. Uh, I remember it like yesterday. It's an 18 by 17 millimeter cyst in the pancreatic head. Uh, I don't know what Anne Marie thinks to me. It looks uniformly anechoic. Imaging is Alabama. It's, uh, it's an old machine. Uh, there was no solid component uh, within the cyst. Um, the main pancreatic duct was about 2 millimeters in the head region. The cyst did not communicate with the pancreatic duct. 
there were no peripancreatic lymph nodes and the rest of the pancreas appeared pretty uh, pretty pristine there were no features of chronic pancreatitis or anything else so i'm going to ask ann marie based on this clinical presentation and morphology what do you think it is and what should we do at eus well, that's, so I think we could use our, our algorithm from this morning. And I didn't know you were going to present a patient with a cyst in the head, otherwise I would have changed my, this is perfect. <laughs> so if we, go, if we look at our, if we think back about what we were talking about earlier, number one, does she have pancreatitis? No, therefore a pseudocyst is very unlikely. Number two, the cyst is in the head, therefore an MCN, because we said that's normally in the body, so an MCN is very unlikely. You're telling us there's no solid component, therefore cystic degeneration of a neuroendocrine tumor or a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, I think, is unlikely. Usually, you would see a thickened wall enhancement. Can you occasionally be wrong? The answer is yes, but that's very rare. So then we're down to either, I think, a, and these are there's a long number of weird and wonderful stuff, but if we go for the common stuff, um, a cirrhosis, so you could be, you know, 45% of cirrhosis have got these classic tiny little cysts. However, f um, uh, 50% look exactly like an IPMN. So it could be a macrocystic cirrhosis, that's one option, or it could be a side branch IPMN. So would I aspirate it? Yes. So would this alter her management? So she's a young woman. If we proved that this was a cirrhosis, then you'd say, thanks very much, I don't, you don't need any more follow-up. So that would significantly alter her thing, so I would biopsy it. Thank you. Steve, uh, any other words of wisdom? Yeah, I think you know these are difficult cases. Uh, they're, they're in the size criteria where there's some risk to sampling. There's also some risk. It's small, but there's risk to sampling. Um, I also think the, the thing we don't realize is that our patients go home and they search pancreatic cyst on the internet and they get into these blogs where six millimeter cysts become cancers and they're very, very concerned. And so you often see these patients move from physician to physician because they don't like what you're telling them. Um, our, our approach has been now shifted a little bit. We tend not to uh, aspirate the cyst if they're less than two centimeters in size, if we don't see any uh, mural nodule or abnormality in the wall of the cyst. Um, and I, I'm not so sure, looking at all the smaller cysts that I've aspirated, that I've ever gotten anything that's changed management that much. One or two isolated cases where you see some dysplasia or you see uh, something on the, a cell that you might pick up that's worrisome, but for the most part, it hasn't helped me that much. So Shanti, you're not an endoscopist, but you have always pulls of wisdom. Yeah, I probably see most of these patients who come to Mayo. So the thing is, uh, uh, in our practice, when you send them for EUS and FNA, when the cysts are less than two centimeters and there's no mural nodule, all our six or seven colleagues, they're not sticking in a needle. And sometimes I have to actually say that please do the FNA when I think, because for me, even though the pretest probability of a cancer inside any of this, this IPM and MCN is very low, but with an, and, they, and usually we use the argument that cytology sensitivity is only 50% or 55%, so don't do it if you don't see anything. But for me, if you do an FNA, and if it is negative, then the negative predictive value to tell the patient you do not have cancer is almost 95 to 98%. So with the, with one to two percent complication, it sometimes I do put there. Please do the thing, but as a rule, they don't. They are not doing it. Well, Anne Marie offers molecular biological analysis of this. I mean, does that change your your management yeah. of these patients? So yeah, I mean, one of the big things I, I, that sort of would be driving me to a biopsy is her age. So you know, is this is this an IPMN? Sure, you can get IPMNs. The youngest person we've ever got was three months old, so you can get an IPMN hmm. at any age. But classically, people present in their 60s, 70s with IPMN. So she's, you said she was in her 40s, is that 44. right? 44. So she's, she's young. It could be an IPMN, but I think it's a little unusual. And if we, we think it's an IPMN, depending on which guideline you follow, you're, we're going to follow her for either five or a lifetime, which is 30 to 40 years. So I would, yes, I, am, I would consider, I would send for molecular markers because if I have a VHL mutation with nothing else, I can tell her with 100% specificity, you do not have an IPMN, you have a cirrhosis. I don't, you don't need to see me, and you need no further imaging. So, so I think this is a really important distinction for the, for the audience. Uh, so uh, I think we, we've got two different sort of uh, situations here. Um, if you, if you uh, aspirate the cyst, 
Most of the time, General John Q. Public Endocrinographer sends it for cytology and sends it for CEA. Th those are the only two things that we send it for. Uh, and uh, I think in Hopkins, uh, you'll send it for this, this panel of uh, molecular markers that you suggested. So uh, the other issue is volume. So uh, I have, have tended to, to do less aspiration because I'm sort of in Steve's camp. We've routinely just sent it for CEA and cytology. CEA, 99% of the time, confuses me more than it, it helps me. And cytology is always negative, uh, at least in, in, in sort of our practice. So the question is, I, I, I guess to, um, to Anne-Marie, is are we really at a point where I'm practicing in uh, Venice, Florida? Uh, do I have access to this panel? Uh, and would an 18 millimeter cyst yield enough fluid that I could send to Hopkins or wherever I'm sending it to make that diagnosis? Because I think you're right. If you tell me that I aspirate it, and with really good certainty, 90% or higher, I can tell whether it's mucinous or whether it's a serous adenoma, then I think we ought to leave this uh, meeting and, and aspirate all of them. But if that's not the case, then, then maybe I won't. Yeah. No, I think that these are great questions. And I, I also want to say I actually don't aspirate most of my cysts. So I actually, the vast majority of people, I do not aspirate. Um, so if this, if, if this was a lady in her 75, I probably wouldn't. But just because she's so young, that's what's pushing me. You ask a great question, which is how much fluid do you need? Do you, if you, you know, there's no use sticking a needle into a, into a cyst if you're not going to be have enough fluid to do it. So for us in our institution, we need around 0 0.5 mils to send CEA, 0 0.5 for amylase, which I hardly ever send, but that's what you need. Cytology is what's ever in the needle. And for, for the molecular markers, you, you, you need approximately 0 0.2 mils. So uh, again, I'm, I don't, I don't, I send molecular markers infrequently, but I currently send them where I think that it will, A, I'll biopsy only if I think I can get enough fluid out, which in a 1.8 centimeter cyst, I think I've got a good chance of getting enough fluid out. And secondly, yeah. I'll, I'll do it when it's gonna change their management. So I don't send it routinely. And uh, uh, should we be doing this all the time? I think the answer is no. I, I don't think I'm going to follow guidelines. I don't think, I think we need, the data is really good. It's, I think it's exciting. There's more and more data coming out. I know the group in Pittsburgh are about to publish a large prospective study, which looks very interesting. Um, uh, we're part of that. I think we're close, but not, but, but not quite there. So I currently use it where it's going to change management and other tests are, are not diagnostic. Okay, let's keep. And the answer is yes, you can have it. Absolutely, it's it's inexpensive. It's seven hundred and fifty dollars, which I think mm. is relatively inexpensive. And the answer is yes, you can order it. Yes, sir. Is a better marker than <laughs> CEA. And uh, second question is a recent study out of Europe showed that secretin or non-secretin MRCP was more accurate than the U.S. in diagnosing mural nodularity and abnormalities of the pancreatic duct. Yeah, um, so I, I have not seen, I haven't read that one, so I'd like to read it. I, we use, we've been using, we use secretin for many years. Uh, we, we started doing it around 12 years ago, um, and we stopped five years ago, and the reason we stopped, so we thought, oh, this is cool, it's great, it's gonna show better communication, etc. It takes double the amount of time, it's really expensive, and we found no benefit in it when we used it. Um, so that's not what we use, but I'd love to see that paper. In terms of your second question, the glucose, absolutely. I think there's some really exciting, interesting data from glucose that was developed um, in, by uh, Walter Park in, in Stanford. There have now been several studies, and what it shows is that, one, you need, need less fluid. Secondly, it suggests that it's equivalent to CEA. And again, CEA, I think, as Rob was saying, is not terribly good. So I think it's, it's certainly very interesting. Is it the same level and quality of data as CEA? The answer is no. Are the guidelines currently recommending it? No, but I would also say that most of the guidelines were written between two to seven years ago. So I think in the next group of guidelines, which will probably start tragically next year, um, it, will, it will likely be addressed. Ravi? Hi. Uh, so I'm from Venice, Florida. So, <laughs> 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 so I, I felt compelled. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> so I send it to Interpace, uh, which is a pathology lab which does that. So they're pretty good. They do it like 0.5 to 0.6 ml, uh, all the stuff. So the only question I have is uh, I use a criteria which is probably not studied that if the CEA is, say, less than 100, I don't ask them to trigger the uh, DNA technology, like the testing and stuff like that. But it's more than 100 to do the uh, mutation analysis and stuff like that. So is that a reasonable approach, or do you normally recommend doing for everybody the mutational analysis? So that, that's a, a, a great question, and I think the data that's out there would suggest that the mutations are actually more sensitive than, than CEA, and I think in the future, again, I, I do think we, we need high-quality prospective data to change management, and that's how we should do it, but I think that that is the way it will go. One very important thing is that to let you know is that not all tests are the same. And so there is a significant difference depending on where you're getting your test done in the ability to detect mutations. So for example, some tests will detect a mutation that's present in 10%, that's been 10% or higher. Some, pretend, some will do 0.3% and some will do 0.01%. So there's a huge difference between, they all say molecular markers, but they're actually very different tests. So it's extremely important to know what is the sensitivity of your test and how are they doing it. They are totally different. Um, so that, the, um, and I think the, the group in Pittsburgh, which is superb, again, that's $750. They have a, they have a detection level of 3%, and I think it, they're excellent tests. So we'll have to keep it quick. Yes? Uh, I have a 70-year-old uh, patient who is otherwise healthy. Incidentally, you discovered a body of pancreas cyst uh, 3.5 centimeters. Uh, no mural nodularity, but there's upstream pancreatic ductal dilatation. I did uh, EUS FNA, and she doesn't have any history of acute or chronic pancreatitis. Um, CEA is 351, uh, but it's negative for KRS and uh, GNS, and I sent the specimen to Pittsburgh. Is there any head-to-head -head, uh, comparison between uh, these different um, testing modalities? How do you resolve the differences where you don't, uh, where the tests don't sway you towards a serious or a mucinous lesion? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm hugging, hugging the, mic the microphone. And um, so if you look at that patient, you've got it, you said a 3.5 centimeter cyst in the body of the pancreas without yeah. stream dilation, without CEA of 350, 360, mm -hmm. but no mutations. No mutations. So, I mean, the, que the question is, is this, I mean, this, everything looks like a, a, an IPMN. The presence of dilation of the duct would concern me. Um, that, that would be, that to me, that's red flags. Um, the... Again, one of the, th the questions, the amount of, so, I mean, again, I'm happy to meet afterwards if you want, the amount of DNA, so one of the challenges with pancreatic cysts is the amount of, of DNA in the mutations are in, at an incredibly low level. So sometimes you can have mutations that are present, but the test can't detect them. That's one of the problems with the test. And again, this is something that will be improved, and that's one of the reasons you need to ask that question, what is the detection level of, your, of the test? For that patient, um, my first question would be, one, how long has she had a dilated duct? Is a dilated duct new? If she's got new dilation, the pancreatic duct, I'd be very, very concerned about it. If she's had it for three to five years, well, then that, that would make me a lot less. And then the, the next question is, you probably need to move to the next level, which I think people will be happy to talk about is maybe, I mean, would you, would you use the, the microbiopsy forceps? Maybe this is where we should be using NCLE. What, what's your recommendation? Yeah, I would send this patient to surgery. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, to me, it's a you know it's a distal extended distal pancreatectomy. You've got a dilated duct. You're not going to be able to sort out whether it's IPMN or the main duct or whether it's actually just compression. And to do a pancreatoscopy is going to be high risk in an elderly patient. I think uh, you're better off just sending this patient to surgery. Okay, so if I will complete this and then I'll take your question. And this could not be done with a case yet. And then this it was an open access EUS. I didn't puncture it. Amylase was 68. The CE was 156. Cytology revealed normal ductal cells. It's a very good pathology division. Trace mucin, but it was a transduodenal pass. So, and that's a picture. So, I'll keep it very brief, Anne-Marie. So, this is my patient uh, with, other, uh, with above labs. What would I do? Follow-up EUA, six months, 12 months, MRI, six, 12, or should I just call the surgeon? This was 2010, sure. before the guidelines existed. Okay. Well, and we're going to have slightly different. We should probably have MRI two, two years. MRI 12 months. MRI 12 months. Okay. 
it gets interesting so this is the picture june 2010 so she comes back july 2011 uh, for another eus she is asymptomatic so what do i do here and mary <laughs> or what did i did wrong well I, i think i think what the first thing again is um one one is obviously this is concerning for a stolic component i one i think the first thing i always say when i sit down with patients is i i tell every single patient that the first thing when you have a patient start a, a surveillance program you want to know you have to have a decent discussion with them is what are the pros and cons is this the right thing to do and as part of that i always tell them that i, I wish i was god and i was perfect but i'm not and that we as radiologists and endocrinologists are not perfect so i think that's one thing and this is concerning for cell component sometimes when you biopsy it you can have you know hemorrhage or something else we love it to, nowadays we've got contrast so we love it to have contrast and also to see what the biopsy is but yeah. that's my biopsy her dental carcinoma she needs a surgeon too it's a pancreatic can- it was an 18 mm pancreatic cancer adherent to the portal vein I think this highlights that you know we have we have these guidelines and all of us I think we're we're one of the problems is we send too many patients to surgery and unfortunately uh, particularly if it's a whipples if you're removing the head of the pancreas even in high volume ca- places that has a de- a risk of death of 1 to 2% so it is not without its significant risks um the guidelines that we use i think they're very reasonable in terms of you got a solid component you got a big cyst you got your ductal dilation these are reasonable but it's not perfect and i think this is why we need new and better tests oh, yes sir your question yeah, um, um, is it not better to avoid a situation where you actually do the eus and then you have to make a decision not to stick the patient at that time uh, usually most of the patients they're pre concerned once you decide to do eus uh, they, they feel that you're concerned about the cyst and then you get in there and you say you know no more nodules so you don't stick the patient is it not better to avoid that situation by deciding when you see the ct scan they don't meet the size criteria no solid components then just follow it longitudinally with mri scan or ct scan rather than do the eus and get there and decide not to stick it and come out tell the patient that you got there and just didn't stick it uh, what was your opinion about that Personally I understand your point but I will tell you that there've been numerous times in my experience where the MRI was read as no mural nodules and the CT was read as no mural nodules and when I did the EUS I indeed find mural nodules so I think the sensitivity of the test depends a lot on your imaging center and your patient's ability to stay still during the procedure and a lot of other factors so I feel better advising the patients after I've done an EUS on a cyst that's larger than 2 cm but as this case demonstrates it's not perfect and i've had similar cases where we've actually biopsied larger cysts and the biopsies looked fine and we ended up sending the patient to surgery anyway and they found adenocarcinoma at the time of surgery because the biopsies are very focused they're not sampling the entire wall and there can be a lot of variability in the wall of a large cyst i think that you know there's no solution to this case uh v has uh, thousands of these because he's done so ma- so many and and i i don't know if this has a perfect answer but for me i i think one thing for the endocrinologists in the audience that it reminds me this obviously you got the portal vein there this looks like it is in the same location but when we're doing these cysts please remember that at least there's a chance in these cyst patients that an adenocarcinoma arises in a area of the pancreas other than where the cyst is so please uh, look at the entire pancreas when you're surveying uh, the cysts so i'm uh, going to skip the discussion because we have covered a lot of uh, points but uh, this is i took all these take home messages from ann marie's most recent chapter so i think we should just manage them before they become neoplastic if we can um patients with high risk features obviously should undergo surgery and eus is reserved for patients with unclear diagnosis uh, when findings will alter our management plan shouldn't be just run routinely and the first line tests are ca mlas and cytology second line will be the uh, confocal laser and the microscopy and the, through the biopsy forceps and molecular markers but you survey them only if they are surgical candidates if a patient is not a surgical candidate they are 90 years old we shouldn't be uh, doing eus because it's not going to alter management So the last case I think is pretty interesting I think Shanti will get excited so this is a 49 year old transfer from an outside hospital uh this was a patient about a, maybe a year and a half back uh, for just management of pancreatitis 
just an attack of pancreatitis. Uh, patient 10 days prior had an ERCP and was had a post ERCP pancreatitis and CT revealed a 4.5 centimeter fluid collection in the pancreatic neck. A percutaneous drain was placed into that 4.5 centimeter collection and that CT they said the reason for the ERCP was there was some sludge in the bile duct. Uh, past medical and surgical histories were unremarkable, so was family history, and the patient was uh, a smoker. Uh, and those were her medications, some anti-cholesterol medications and so on. So the patient came to us with, the reason they called us is because, well, there's a small cyst with a drain, and the patient is screaming with pain, and we have no idea what's going on. Uh, so the patient was on a hydromorphone drip. Uh, they were also giving IV. Uh, the patient was started on uh, ceftriaxone antibiotic sliding scale insulin because they said the blood sugars are now out of control and they put the patient on TPM. A patient came to us and uh, the temperature was, the patient was febrile, tachycardic, respiratory rate was 22. Abdomen was soft but severe pain. I mean, you, you touch that abdomen, the patient screams. Uh, the bowel sounds were present, but it looked a little bit disoriented. Uh, the labs revealed a wide count of 31.9. Uh, platelets were about 180. Renal functions, no problems before, but the BUN and creatinine were high. Glucose was 196. LFTs were marginally high. Alphas was 146. And uh, EGFR was 18. Um, just because of the pain and the renal function uh, being abnormal, and sometimes we say something doesn't look right. So the patient was admitted to the hospital. Uh, we wanted to get a good quality imaging. Uh, but we were told because the renal function is bad, we need to get the nephrologist involved, and they recommended dialysis. Uh, ID was consulted. Uh, antibiotic was changed to meropenem. And uh, one of the first things we thought we should do is to, remove, is to either start enteral nutrition or a nasogeginal feeding tube. But at this point, the patient did not even have a CT scan or a MRI at our facility because of all the problems. The patient was a little uh, uh, disoriented and was not in a... Not in a good situation uh, to go for a radiologic imaging. That was outside CT scan. You can see there's no fluid collection, very little, but there was a perk drain coming out. And because the patient came uh, for a nasogeginal feeding tube, you know, uh, I thought, well, let me just drop an EU bus and have a look at it uh, because you know, I'm going to do an endoscopic procedure anyway. So there's no fluid collection on the pancreas. It's just a ill-defined pancreas and the pancreatic parenchyma. I can't see a fluid. Obviously, I'm not going to uh, sample this and, and, and cause a problem. So, Shanti, what did this patient likely have at initial presentation? And what is happening now? And what should I do? So, I think the most important thing that is, uh, uh, my opinion is, they shouldn't have actually put in a needle at all. That's uh, the thing. If the patient had post-ERCP pancreatitis, and it is something more like what we used to call phlegmon or something, in so quickly putting in a needle for a 4.5 centimeter uh, thing is, 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 is not to be done. And whether that has caused some infection and the patient deteriorated, high white count, fever, renal insufficiency, liver function tests going on, that is the thing. So at the beginning, I would have treated conservatively without a needle. And uh, is enteral nutrition the only thing I can do for this patient at this point? Yeah, at this point of time, she's about two weeks now? Or two, That's correct, two yeah, weeks. See, approximately two weeks. Yeah. So the patient is not, I think we should probably put a nasogeginal as distally as you can, and uh, we have to stop TPN because TPN is not good and uh, it has its own problems. So. But more important is you have done the EUS and you find it's an ill-defined mass. So the question is, is it actually a post-ERCP pancreatitis which is going into some necrotizing type of thing but not yet liquefied? That's the question to, the, to you at the time. So the problem with EUS is we don't have any morphological criteria for diagnosing evolving necrosis. We think we know what it is. It's clinical. Uh, if you just show me an EUS image, I'll probably call it autoimmune pancreatitis. I wouldn't know with a good clinical context what this is. So the patient is now day three after the transfer, still remains febrile with antibiotics. The patient was intubated. Heart rate is still 120. Blood pressure is, she's getting, uh, uh, he's getting hypotensive, 90 to 58. Antifungal coverage was added. 
Uh, the nasogeneral feeding tube, as you can see, is in place. The patient is on dialysis, and they wanted to start the patient on IV vasopressors. So this patient clearly has SIRS. So this is the same first CT, Ex or you have done a non-contrast? No, this contrast is a follow At this point, we had the follow-up CT scan. So this is a non-contrast? or uh, This is a non-contrast CT. So there is humongous amount of air, you know? So that's there right from the neck body region going all the way into the right paracolic gutter. So the question is, you know, was there some small retrodordinal perf or something at the beginning uh, that has caused that phlegmon type of thing and then the patient deteriorated because they have put in a drain into that infection and now there is gas forming, gas formation out of fistula. What is it? I don't know. So my personal take was it's uh, infected necrotizing pancreatitis. That's what, you know, at that point, that's all I had. And what would our friends from Netherlands tell us to do? Because this patient has got organ dysfunction at this point, right? Call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so now there is, now, now, now there are studies that are coming up, you know, doing it earlier than four weeks, earlier than a wall being formed. Uh, but here, the question is, uh, can you do a debridement? Is there... There's, all we are seeing is gas. Mm -hmm. Even if you follow that early going in, you know, like the University of Minnesota or the Dutch people study, you know, what are we going to do here? Because could there be, because this is going to be that soft white plastic type of tissue, you know, are we going to do more damage and bite the bullet and just stick with the conservative thing? Because we always don't have to act, you know, so we know that the mortality is high with both ways. Yeah. So, so the you can see the perk drain is gone. Yeah. Okay. So the ICU called me. Remember, this is not Colorado or Hopkins or Mayo Clinic Rochester. This is Orlando, Florida. So the drain is gone, and the radio and the ICU um, person on call called me and said, "Are you going to do something, or should I call a pancreatic surgeon, or should I stick a drain inside? Because a family is very upset that nothing is being done. Patient came here, you pulled out a drain." Uh, you started a enteral feeding tube. Uh, you claim to be an, uh, uh, an interventional endoscopist with expertise in this area, and you are telling us, don't do anything. So what would you do, Anne-Marie? <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's reasonable. Uh, Steve, anything else? Yeah, I, I talked to the family. I'd let, you know, obviously, we'd like to see more images from the CT, but I suspect that there is a, a fairly significant collection there. And the question is, can early intervention help these, these collections? And I don't know that we know the answer. So there was no wall. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't do anything to this patient. But uh, I put a gun to a surgeon. He said, okay, I'll go for an open pancreatic necrosectomy. So that's a pancreas that was taken out with all the drains, a midline incision. Uh, he's a good surgeon. Uh, he, he just had to do it because it was compulsion. And... Patient died uh, about four days later. So I thought uh, I can probably, I can, I can summarize. The, there are a couple of golden principles that you never breach. Again, our Dutch friends taught this to us. So there's no indication to interview an acute phase of pancreatitis. I don't think we should ever touch a patient, uh, particularly if a collection is small, it's not walled off. Because most of the time, 95% of the time, it will dissolve by itself. It just needs pain medicines and maybe some uh, nutrition in some form. There's no reason for antibiotics. And then I think unless you have infected necrotizing pancreatitis in conjunction with clinical deterioration, you can intervene, but the, that necrosis should be walled off for an optimal outcome. Otherwise, prayers and being patient is more likely to be successful than any kind of intervention. But if you don't have infection, if you don't have gas, and if the patient has got ongoing organ failure for several weeks, preferably the, you know, the time frame is three to four weeks. We should wait for the three to four week time frame. And again, the key here is the necrosis should be walled off. And finally, uh, although this did not happen here, the initial intervention cannot be yeah, endoscopic necrosectomy, just because we can do it, or it also should not be a surgical open necrosectomy. It should always be decompression, either a percutaneous drainage or an endoscopic drainage, 
and this can be followed later if there is no treatment response with an endoscopic or a video assisted retroperitoneal debridement this was your guidelines shanti i'm just repeating it from the iap no no i think this is a very important uh, uh, lesson that we learned that the guidelines are actually correct you know so although they are uh, in endoscopy uh, sometimes we get it right I, i think you also highlight one of the one of the most difficult things that we face as uh, you know uh, as individuals caring for these patients which is managing family expectations very true so actually we are running a randomized trial right now and dr bang is leading this trial with all these institutions so this is on the endoscopy side to see whether we should do an index necrostomy it looks like there are some retrospective studies but no strong data uh, or should we just go directly and 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 proceed with a uh, uh, proceed with a step up approach so it's a, it's a pretty 70 patients uh, sample study so i think uh, one of the important contributions you have made many contributions from your group over the years which we all follow now they have come to the guidelines is what i like best in the last 5 years is the lambs should be removed at uh, you know no more than 3 weeks i was seeing so many problems earlier with lambs going beyond you know 3 weeks and then now i think you have made it a pretty standard everybody is following that route you know yeah. i think we have to remember that these are also uh, very sick patients right yeah. and i think i would have predicted from the laboratory studies that you showed me at the beginning that this patient was not going to do well uh you know mortality is not as common as it used to be but it still occurs in these patients and i i've certainly seen these patients die without surgery without intervention uh, trying to get through that period of time so we actually have come up with protocol it's not a perfect protocol but it's some sort of a protocol that i will encourage you to read it's called since we are always known for disney we thought we should have something in medicine after orlando so it's called the orlando protocol for fluid collections but i would encourage you to read it we have got some fairly good guidelines on when you intervene and when do you perform reinterventions and how do you approach the different situations um whether it's a single collection multiple collection whether it's tracking down and so on or whether the, there's a disconnected duct Um, but uh, so yes, sir, last. It's yeah. just published recently. Yeah, very recently. Okay. Um, uh, very, very recently. I think I should read that. From a medical legal standpoint, when you reviewed the case, was the ERCP indicated to begin with? I mean, it's a sludge in the, you know. Or should it have been an EUS to determine if there was anything in the bile duct? I mean, we always do an EUS before an ERCP. The damage is done. Uh, you know, hindsight is always 2020. But, uh, but I think. Um, I think this is my uh, last slide but I want to oh this is again this is from Shanti's one of when I was a fellow I attended his lecture and I took some notes and I still have it here so he said well as endoscopists uh, just don't treat your patients and send them you think your job is done he said new onset diabetic patients send them to an endocrinologist always get a fecal elastase at that point you told us fecal elastase and if it is low treat them with pancreatic enzymes if there is a gallbladder you told us within 6 months they may have another attack of pancreatitis if the gallbladder is not removed so get them out lifestyle modifications uh, the only thing that you change today is if you have chronic pancreatitis that is really bad don't put them on a very low fat diet they can take fat uh, and uh, education we explored at that point the concept of an indwelling stents in disconnected pancreatic duct i think evidence is imperfect but still i think if you have a disconnected duct we leave behind double pigtail plastic stents not a lumen opposing metal stent and we are not at least we are endoscopists we are not gastroenterologists i think uh, you have to find them a good gastroenterologist in the community <laughs> and we have them follow with them we again quote your uh, papers from birmingham days that you know if you have a disconnected duct and you have put double pigtails just leave them for months years whatever if you're not having a problem and uh, we quote that to all our fellows and we quote that to all our uh, patients so before i'm going to conclude i always in this uh, in all sessions with a remark so you have my email so if you think that this course was good please don't even bother sending me an email because you, we don't expect you to come here on a saturday and sunday uh, if we are going to waste your time however if there was something that was imperfect with this course you have to send me an email so that we don't do the same mistake the next time uh, just feel free to contact i i can take uh, 
uh, any brutal email that you can think, I can handle it. But please feel free to communicate. But most importantly, I think, uh, you know, it was, it was so much fun to have uh, 340 people uh, this weekend uh, to come uh, from across the country and spend time with us. So Rob and I and all the physicians of the Digestive Health Institute are very grateful to you for your presence. And the reason that you came is not to uh, look at me and Rob. We are aware of that. It's because of the world-class faculty that we have. When you have good faculty, the conference is always successful. So thank you so much uh, for being and uh, being here on a Sunday with us and enlightening us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.